welcome everybody to uh, my social uh, social distancing um, home office. <laughs> um, thank you so much for coming to the what we're calling the crisis conversations uh, live from the Better Life Lab. This we're building on the Better Life Lab podcast that we've had for a couple of seasons where we explore um, how we combine work and life and conflict and stress and gender equality. And we just thought the coronavirus is disrupting absolutely everything about the way we work and live and love and relate to each other and expect from each other and our communities, our businesses and our government. Um, and it's all happening so fast. And I was having a crisis moment at about four in the morning the other night. And I thought, what, you know, what can I learn from you know, this little room here and feeling very isolated and really wanting to understand this, this fast moving story trying to kind of get a sense of sense making. And so we wanted to create this space where we could come together, take a deep breath and pause and reflect. That's why we're doing it on Friday, sort of like after the crush of the, of the week and the craziness, take a moment to pause. Let's see if we can come together, create some connection, share some stories, try to get a, uh, try to get a better sense of what's going on and how this might change not only um, our current experience, but how it might, how it might change things into the future. So today is our first day, we're launching. So we've got all sorts of, uh, if we're a little rough around the edges, we apologize, we're trying to figure it out. If you dialed in early, we're still trying to figure out how to work Zoom. Many of us last week didn't even know how to use Zoom. That was me too. So bear with us. Um, we're really excited to, to be able to make this interactive. We wanna hear from you, we wanna hear your stories. And today, we really want to take advantage of the fact that we have Vicki Shabo, who is brilliant. She is one of, she's a senior fellow in the Better Life Lab. I should probably introduce myself if you, don't know, if you don't know me. That was a little slip up on my part. So I'm Bridget Schulte. I'm a writer and a journalist, and I direct the Better Life Lab with a work-life, gender equality, and social policy, family supportive social policy program at New America, a nonpartisan think tank. And Vicki is, is our senior fellow for paid leave policy and strategy strategy and policy. I'm sorry if I got that mixed up. I'm a little nervous. Uh, and uh, she has been just really on the front lines of so much of, um, you know, the public policy making the, trying to figure out how do we make work and life work for uh, families, for women, for individuals. She was at the National Partnership for Women and Families for many years. And we're very lucky to have her here because Congress has just passed and the president has signed some of the most sweeping legislation uh, after years and years of, uh, of really a lack of movement on things like paid family leave and paid sick days. And it's all happened again so fast and there's a, it was changing as it was going. And I thought this is a great moment for us to really take a minute to pause and reflect. Like, what does this mean? What's really going on? What's good? What's missing? And what's next? And how could this change things? So Vicki, let me turn it over to you. And let me just ask you to just pause and reflect. This is an enormous moment. You just wrote a piece on Medium that published about 10 minutes ago, and you called it historic and necessary. Can you talk a little bit about what this current moment is and, and what's it, what is it gonna mean for people? Sure, uh, well, it's really exciting to be here on this inaugural uh, <laughs> cast. Hang on. Ah. There we go, good. Uh, it says I'm muted. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah. Can everybody hear? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. People are saying yes, we can uh, hear. Thank you, everybody. All right. <laughs> cool. Uh, so it's great to be here on this. I think this is a fun uh, way to pass the time as we're social distancing. I'm actually a person who really prefers working in an office around other people. So I'm always happy to reach out and have social contact. And I, I know a lot of people feel the same. Uh, so as, as you said, Bridget, you know, this has been a really incredible couple of weeks with respect to congressional action um, on it's the kind of time that people need uh, when they are sick, when they need to care for a loved one. Um, now with so many of us dealing with kids uh, who are out of school or childcare or adults in our lives who would otherwise be in care arrangements during the day. So um, we're in this really fast paced and incredible moment as we're all trying to navigate this new world of working from home and remote lobbying and remote advocacy and, and Zoom calls at all hours to try to organize things. But, uh, you know, as you said, Congress did some pretty important work and their work is undone. Um, and so before I sort of dive into that, I just want to 
set the stage a bit for, uh, for participants that are less familiar with the US framework around access to leave, uh, which has been laid bare as completely inadequate um, in this moment of crisis. So overall in the US, uh, the, the law of the land as it relates to, to workers' ability to take time off, take time away from their jobs, to deal with their own health issue or a family member's health issue or to welcome a new child uh, is the Family and Medical Leave Act. That was passed in 1993 and it guarantees uh, to workers and businesses with 50 or more employees unpaid job protected leave for up to 12 weeks to deal with your own serious health issue, to care for a parent, a child, or a spouse with a serious health issue, to welcome a new child, or for about the last decade for military families to deal with certain military caregiving purposes. Um, but you might have noticed that I stressed unpaid, and that's the limiting factor of the FMLA. And in the absence of paid leave requirements, um, of which only a handful of states uh, have uh, and about two handfuls of, of states have with respect to paid sick days, many people don't have the paid time that they need uh, when an illness strikes or a serious family need arises. Because isn't it true, like if you have unpaid leave, you know, the, I think the research shows that if you have, uh, you know, a white collar job or you have, uh, you know, you work for a larger employer, you're more likely to have uh, some kind of private paid leave program but that for a lot of people, um, if you're an hourly worker or, you know, if you're, you know, even a public, uh, you know, you work for a public, um, uh, 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 sorry, organization, uh, you really don't have access to any kind of paid leave. And then you can't afford to take time off. And, you know, that's where you get these horrific statistics that right. one in four uh, mothers return to work within two weeks in the United States, which is just outrageous. So right. with that, you, like you're saying, we've got this really inadequate system and yeah. people like you have been working for decades to try to get that fixed, to say we are the only advanced economy without paid maternity leave. How can that be in the 21st century? We are one right. of two advanced economies with no paid sick days. Like, you know, and so we're actually asking people to take a lot of risk on themselves and it leaves them with so little choice. We have to choose between either going to work or paying your bills, which just is an untenable choice. So what does this, um, you know, this, this sweeping emergency legislation, what is this going to do? Right, so in this moment where it's clear that as a matter of public health, it's imperative that workers are sick, be able to stay home, Congress took a first step. So the bill that was passed and enacted into law last week, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, uh, mandates employers to provide up to 10 paid sick days for uh, workers who work full-time, uh, who are quarantined or isolated on the guidance of a health official or a public official, who are experiencing system, uh, symptoms of COVID, who are caring for another individual who needs help or whose child's school is closed. Again, 10 paid sick days. In this emergency, these sick days are being reimbursed by the government. Mm -hmm. uh, key difference with how the states and cities that have put paid sick days laws in place uh, have structured them. It's certainly different than how we would structure it in a normal time. Um, but there are some key limitations with this provision. The other thing that Congress did was enact um, extended leave for school closures. So, you know, millions of children are out of school right now. Parents need to be able to take care of them. Uh, and so what Congress said was, if you can't work or telework and your child is home, you can take extended paid leave. Again, um, there are limitations. So for both of these provisions, the paid sick days bucket and this extended school leave bucket, it only applies to people in businesses uh, with under 500 employees or to public agencies. So that's- so who, Yeah, who does that leave out? That's, uh, yeah, that's enormous. Yeah, leaves out half the workforce. <laughs> that larger employers often provide paid sick time to their employees, but they don't always provide that paid sick time to their hourly workers, similar to the disparities we talked about before. So in practical terms, what this means right now at this moment, as we think about the businesses that are still open, uh, we're thinking about large grocery store chains, pharmacy chains, uh, big box retail stores, 
uh, warehouses, which are staffing up in this moment, um, and other large companies where uh, fast food chains, for example, that are still open because people can carry the food out. Right. These workers that are literally on the front lines of serving all of the rest of us, and they may not have access to paid sick time, even in this crisis, when they feel sick, when they know that a family member or someone in their household has been exposed, or when their child is now out of school and they need to be able to care for that child. So this is a huge gap in what Congress did, and it's something that needs to be addressed ASAP. Um, unfortunately, so, Congress didn't do that in this package that's about to be passed today or tomorrow, and it means that we need to come back to keep demanding these changes going forward. So let me ask you, because uh, you know there are some places, like you'd mentioned, just, just talking about paid sick days. There are some states, there are some cities that have paid sick days laws, and then the research shows that actually people are healthier there. You know, they, there isn't as much infection because then workers don't have to make that choice about coming to work or being able to pay a bill, which is huge. You know, and, and you would think in a pandemic that that's something that lawmakers would take into account, that this actually is good for public health. But the other right. thing that I found really striking, the CDC has, a, has done a report that in a previous norovirus outbreak, you still had people come, like one in five restaurant workers still coming into work with symptoms like vomiting and diarrhea because they were afraid they wouldn't be able to pay their bills or they'd lose their jobs. So it sounds like you're saying that the way the bill has passed, all the people that we are now relying on in our isolated bubbles, the delivery workers, the restaurant workers, they may not be covered. So they may have to be making these really horrific decisions that now are life and death. So when you say we need to take action, how likely is it? You know, like where, where are we politically? Like, uh, where's the resistance to doing this? Well, traditionally, businesses have stood in the way um, of, an, of policies like this. So every, you know, you mentioned the states, there are now about 12 states that have some type of paid sick days or paid time off law in place. Some of them do have carve outs um, similar to not as big as this, but for smaller businesses, some of them are more comprehensive. About two dozen cities, there are also longer term paid family and medical leave insurance programs in place in, uh, in five states. Um, and so, you know, the resistance has traditionally come from the organized business community. In this particular case, what's really interesting is that businesses are being fully rebated for this, uh, for this cost, reimbursed for this cost. The legislation that is currently before Congress that passed the Senate the other night and it's going through the House actually includes provisions that allow advanced credits um, against sick leave so that businesses can be reimbursed more quickly and includes a provision for small business loans that can be used to pay for payroll and sick leave. So um, the resistance here may be, it's also ideological um, where conservatives, Republicans traditionally don't want government to grow. Um, but I think what we're going to see over the past, over the next several weeks as Congress is gearing up to pass this other package is the importance of journalists who are um, amplifying the stories of workers on the front lines, the important of, importance of activist groups that are organizing those workers um, to make sure that their stories and their experiences are being heard, um, as well as work, you know, for professional advocates who are really then aggregating those stories and helping to make sure that lawmakers are seeing those stories um, and to document the harms that are being caused in the health system, in businesses, when workers are forced to go to work sick. Uh, so there's a lot to be done. And just one, one quick thing to say, I was really encouraged yesterday when Speaker Pelosi uh, did a press conference on uh, the work that she thinks needs to, be, needs to be done in the next package. And one of the things she specifically called out was expanding the paid family and medical leave component to be not just the school leave that that uh, piece got whittled down to at the 11th hour um, in the last package, but actually to be able to make sure that people who need to be quarantined for more than 10 days, which is what the recommendation is, people right. who need to be able to care for an adult family member who's out of care, uh, to be able to make sure that somebody who's caring for a child or a family member who is sick and then gets sick themselves is able to take that extra time. So I think it's great that it's on uh, the speaker's radar screen. We need to make sure that it's on every member of Congress's radar screen for this next package. When we're spending $2 trillion, it's crazy to think that we can't afford this too. 
Absolutely. You know, we've got um, Linda. So what, what we'd love to do now is open it up. If people have stories or reflections they want to share, if they've got questions, um, you know, this is a great opportunity to have a conversation. We're going to, you know, we're going to try to do this as unwieldy as it is on Zoom. Um, Linda, can we unmute you? You had, um, you made a really important point and, uh, you know, and Vicki, maybe you can address this as well, is that yeah. not only large employers were exempted, but also <laughs> love them, love the cat, but also <laughs> nurses and health professionals and people who are literally putting their lives on the line. Linda, can you, um, um, uh, can you share your story? Sure. Well, thank you so much for organizing this. So I'm sort of speaking on behalf of conversations I've had with my brother, who is the doctor in Boston, and my mom, who's a retired nurse in Boston, who's actually going to be coming into the hospital um, to help out because there are shortages of nurses. But there was discussion about how nurses are paid on an hourly basis. So if they're not working, then they're not receiving um, their pay. And there's also been discussion that um, COVID-19 um, is may not allow, having COVID-19 may not allow you to receive sick paid leave. Mm. So that's been a discussion that they've been having. Yeah, yeah one of the other outrageous carve outs uh, or potential carve outs in the bill that Congress passed and another one of its big imperfections is that both employers of health providers and the Secretary of Labor can determine that health providers can be carved out of the right to sick leave under this act. Which if you think about it, these are literally the heroes of this pandemic, the people who are caring for everybody else, who are risking their own lives um, with protective gear that's inadequate. Um, and the idea that we would both have them risk their own personal health, but also have them then be exposed to more people who may have come to the hospital for a different reason, uh, is is really nonsensical. And so, Linda, I'm so glad that you pointed that out. It's another area that really needs to be fixed in this next uh, wave of legislation. So, um, Vicki, we also have a question from Trudy. She she was she's wanting a little bit more clarity, and that there is it's so much confusion. She's talking yeah. about like where you know the coronavirus families. You know what is that? What was this big two trillion dollar package? Where are where are all of these pieces? How does this all fit together? Yeah, it's a great question and it's a bit mind boggling. So the first package uh, dealt with health and, and health providers. Um, and it was the smallest of the packages and the most limited. The second one was much more expansive. It included some unemployment protections, mostly to shore up state systems, uh, included uh, food, nutrition, health, other health care purposes. Um, that was the family's first coronavirus response. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm, I love your cat. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, and um, and then uh, sorry, I got distracted there. <laughs> you can come here. And then this third package is the two trillion dollar stimulus bill. It includes rebates to lots of American families, so direct cash. It included something we didn't talk about, which is pandemic unemployment assistance, which actually includes for the first time uh, ways for workers who are not eligible for state unemployment insurance and who have family and medical leave type circumstances, as well as other circumstances directly related to COVID to, re to receive payments if they're unemployed, um, partially employed or unable to work. Um, but, but there is a lot left undone. And so what we're hearing House leadership and, and uh, Speaker Pelosi in particular talk about is a fourth package uh, that they will be thinking about over the coming weeks um, and could take up uh, later in April when the Senate is expected to come back. So I think it's exciting from an advocacy perspective. There's so much that's been left undone. You know, we've talked about paid leave. Child care is another huge piece of this puzzle. You know, not only are there the workers that we've talked about who are still on the front lines, who are showing up to place-based workplaces, but their child care is maybe shut down. Right. And then on the child care provider side, they too are businesses um, who are being forced into dire circumstances and in some cases forced to close because they don't have resources coming in anymore. So child care is a huge problem that has to be addressed in that next package. Um, and then there's more increases in um, SNAP, food, food benefits, and other vital services um, where appropriations were provided as part of the, the stimulus, the $2 trillion package, but it's not going to be enough. Um, and all of this really underscores the structural changes that need to be made 
to a number of these different programs um, in order to ensure that we're not in this position again um, if something unexpected strikes. You know, um, Haley has just, uh, who's our deputy director at the Better Life Lab, she has just um, put in something in the chat box. Um, can we unmute Haley so you can make that point to the group? Haley and uh, Rosalind, also of uh, the Better Life Lab, have, uh, in, you know, in addition, I've done some work on it, and Vicki's been instrumental as well, been, have been tracking what the large companies are actually doing, saying that they're going to do, and then what the journalists are reporting, what that's, what's actually happening on the ground. Haley, um, can we unmute you, and can you make the point that you just made in the chat box and, and talk a little bit more about, uh, about what's happening on the ground? Sure. Thanks, Bridget. So um, as Vicki said already, these companies that have more than 500 employee, employees are carved out of the Families First bill, um, which means that they're left to voluntarily offer emergency paid sick policies to their workers. And we saw a big rush of companies kind of do this right at first to try to get ahead of it. Um, Walmart put out a, what seemed like a good policy on paper, for example, and um, got some uh, props for that in the media. But what we're sort of seeing in, in the next wave of reporting is that most workers are finding these policies aren't working in practice. Um, they're getting pushback from managers when they try to use them, and they're really worried that they're going to be punished if they use these policies, um, whatever, they, whatever they say in, in their sort of written policy, whether they can actually take them. And what, what I'm finding as we've been tracking this, we have about 90 companies listed now online, and you can check out, I can even drop the link in here in just a second, you can check out what their policies have said. But we're, we're really finding that this is an issue. And in my mind, and I, I'm wondering what Vicki's seeing on this, it really seems that only something like federal legislation would actually be able to enforce these policies right now so workers can actually use them. Yeah, that's a great point, Haley. And thank you so much for your work tracking down all of these policies and, and keeping your great resource updated. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is the case in general. Um, companies will often take a lead and do really important work establishing, you know, establishing their own policies. And some companies do a fantastic job of that and are very uh, thoughtful about how they not only put a policy in place, but also have that policy trickle down to their managers so that frontline workers get the benefit of what's on paper. Sometimes it doesn't work that way. Um, and unfortunately, in a circumstance like this, we're seeing the consequences of that. Um, as you said, you know, the, the benefit of a statute is that companies have a legal obligation to follow the law. Um, uh, federal agencies, or in the case of state law or local law, state or local agencies have the, um, have the authority to enforce those laws. And that's really um, what's needed. It's not the only thing that's needed. We know even where laws are in place, um, sometimes enforcement is lax or people don't know their rights. But having that statutory protection as a safeguard is critical to making sure that, um, that the structures are in place for people to be able to take the time that they need without retribution. So next we want to, uh, I, I think we've got Cindy Murray, um, who's a, a worker from Wall Street, or Wall Street, sorry, woo, uh, Walmart <laughs> uh, on, on, the, on the phone line. Sorry, that was a little slip. Um, so we're going to try to figure out which phone line it is so we can um, uh, unmute you. So if you, um, so bear with us. But while we're doing that, um, Amy Hilbrich uh, Davis made a really great point in the chat. So Amy, I think you're on, on mute. Can you uh, come on into the conversation and make your point and, and uh, sh share in the discussion? Of course. Hi, Bridget and uh, Vicki. It's a, it's a real pleasure. Sure. It's, uh, it's a thrill to watch you both work together and to bring this audience together about such a, just an amazingly important topic. And, you know, what is, um, what I keep thinking day in and day out is I work within corporations, right? And I speak to family success and I work with employees to help them feel more successful at home. So this work of home, right? It's immense. We all know it, um, especially if you've raised children. Bridget and I have had discussions about this. And, and now all of a sudden, the work of home is out there for everyone. It's on Facebook, it's on Instagram. People are talking about how am I going to uh, make dinner and manage remote learning and do my this. And, it, and what's so crazy is this is the work of home. It's been happening for centuries. And now I love that the cameras are going home um, and seeing this work. And I'm just so interested in, in, in what you, what you sort of can forecast, Vicki, about 
is this going to change this work and done in the margins? What do you think? I think it's a fantastic question. I've been thinking a lot about that as I've just seen my own friends uh, who are, you know, stay at home parents who aren't used to homeschooling and work out of the home parents who are now managing yeah. their work and their kids school. Um, and yeah, I think that this moment is one that really could catalyze if we play it right um, yeah. and help people remember the emotions that they felt during this time that could really catalyze a transformational change around the value of care. Um, and whether that's the value of care that teachers in classrooms do for kids every day, whether that's the value of care that caregivers provide to the people that they're taking care of, um, and whether it's the, or the value of care that um, parents whose work is in the home uh, have um, and, and provide to their families and to society. So, yeah, I mean, I think we're all getting a taste of, uh, of the value of care and how unappreciated it is. And, and that's hopefully a wake up call to many people. That's great. Well, thank you so much for all of that. Uh, we, we're going to go to Cindy now. Cindy, thank you so much for being for waiting patiently. We weren't sure which number was yours, so we weren't sure which one to be unmute. So, Cindy, I understand you are on a break, uh, sitting in your car, uh, and uh, very appreciative that you've taken a break uh, where you work in a big box store. And we really want to hear you're kind of on the front lines. You're out there, you know, helping people get their groceries and, you know, even in this social distancing, we still need to, to eat and survive. And what's that like for you? And what is it that you need, uh, you know, in terms of feeling supported and having paid sick days and, and time, you know, paid time off, you know, in case you get sick or family gets sick? Can you, can you check? Up? We have just about a, a minute or two left because we started a little late. We're, we're going to try to finish up, but we'd love to kind of have okay. final thoughts from you and hearing your story. Well, thank you so much for having me. This is such an important time. Um, I work for Walmart, been here 20 years. Um, I, we started an organization, UFR, United for Respect. Um, it's really rough here on the front lines. Um, they tell us that we can self-quarantine if we needed to. But the point about that is, you know, in my state, we have five, five sick days that we can have, right? But so I'm a 19-year associate. In order to get those hours, they pay us one hour for every 30 hours that I work. So it's hard for workers here to take the time to even self-quarantine, even if they're sick. That's why they come to work sick. Because if you look at it, even though our state says we can have five, six days, we don't get those. We, Walmart went to what was called PTO hours. Um, so they were taking those now. Mind, I'm a 19-year associate. I get one hour for 30 hours I work, and that's 19 years. So they go by the length of years that you've been here to decide how much time, like me, it's one hour for 30 hours. So Would Cindy, you think about could, that? So, Cindy, if I could just jump in. That? Yeah, so if I could jump in, Cindy. So, you know, what's it like for you when, when all of us, we're here, you know, on, on Zoom, out of, you know, we're social distancing, we're all stuck at home. You're going out to work every day. You know, this pandemic is, you know, the United yes. States just yesterday was, uh, you know, we, we now have the most confirmed cases in the world. What is that like for you uh, going to work every day? It's scary. I worry about taking this virus home. I, um, worry about the workers that are in the store. I worry about myself, whether or not I will become, I will get this. Um, the only thing I can do because I can't afford to stay home. Workers, not just me, other workers cannot afford the fact. That's why we, we want Walmart to step up to the plate and maybe, you know, at this time, maybe pay your workers a better sick time. Maybe give us better medical. Cause I mean, like if I get sick, unless I can prove that I got the coronavirus, will we be paid anything really from Walmart? So at this point, it's, it's really rough on all workers. And, and they are scared. I mean, I look at the customers that are here. They're also scared. You can see the fear in their face. It's actually really airy. Yeah. But I have to continue to work. Um, so when I go home, yeah, I know you guys think this is crazy, but I carry Lysol with me. So I, I wear a mask. I wear gloves. 
Um, we spoke out on Tuesday at a press conference about how Walmart needed to step up to the plate and disinfect their stores. And so now they're doing that. I work in the fitting room. They, as of yesterday, shut the rooms down and allow no one to try clothes on due to that, you know, it could be, it's too contagious for everyone. Right. But the fact right. still lies for workers. And, I mean, we're so low paid. I don't make $15 an hour, and I've been here 19 years. Wow. So if I go home and stay home at getting one hour every 30 hours, I don't have no PTO time. I don't have sick time. And I think this is a time in our country that we need to hold these companies that are billion-dollar industries. They need to be held accountable. They need to step up to the plate. They need to give up. In my state, is five sick days. Why can't Walmart give these workers five sick days that are paid? You know, give them the hours for those five days. Well, Cindy, it's not happening at Walmart. Cindy, you've made, you, you know, uh, you have just made such chillingly important points. Thank you so much for sharing your story. You know, and when you're talking about Walmart stepping up to the plate, that's what this legislation has basically, that's where we are. We're sort of relying on companies sort of in their, with, in the goodness of their hearts to take action. And, you know, that's what we're tracking and not all of them are. And is that really the right place to leave it? Is this really something that, that we really need the government to take in, you know, that we need our policies to be much more comprehensive. So with that, you know, it's 134. I want to be very respectful of everyone's time. We said we'd take about 30 minutes. So I just want to take a minute to thank everybody for coming. Uh, Cindy, thank you so much for sharing your story. Vicki, thank you so much for sharing your expertise. I want to thank uh, my Better Life Lab team, who is just the best in the world. Thank you for supporting this. The New America team, uh, David Shulman, who is just the best producer in the world. <laughs> thank you all for uh, joining with us today. We will be doing this every Friday at 1, these crisis conversations. You're all invited. Vicki, you too, to come next week. <laughs> uh, next week, we'll have Eve Brodsky, who is the, um, she's the author of the New York Times bestseller, Fair Play. And to some of your points that you made, Amy, we're going to be talking about how the coronavirus might be really shifting things at home, the, the unfair division of labor at home. So we'll be talking about that. Um, in the chats, please, uh, if you have other ideas, if there are things that you want to talk about or there are uh, experts that you think would be good to have or stories to share, please let us know either in the chat or send me an email, uh, direct, you know, DM me, send me a Twitter, whatever. We really want these to be um, very much of the moment and useful for people. So thank you all for coming today and uh, wash your hands, stay safe, and I'll see you next week. <laughs>